Hello, I'm going to give you a, a brief introduction to uh, what Pivotal does and what our customers do. And as a result, if I can go to the right slide here, as a result, uh, if you'll pardon the cheesy title, uh, what the secrets of success are for digital transformation. Now, first of all, uh, digital transformation is almost a, a useless word at this point, uh, phrase, I should say, but I don't know what else we have. When I think about digital transformation and why, when I observe strategies that companies are putting into place, their programs, if you will, what it amounts to that at least I care about is how they're focusing on improving their software. They're thinking about how would we use our custom written software in a very strategic way to really uh, speed up our time to market, to speed up the quality of software we have, and therefore give the business side of the house a lot more latitude and flexibility to evolve and innovate itself. So how do we get to the point where we can have not only uh, our IT provide good programmable software, I mean to program it, but we can make our business programmable as well. And that's what I think of digital transformation as, is figuring out how to create better software and, cre and become, you know, some people like to say becoming a software organization, but I'm a lot more focused on, uh, I mean, if you want to sell software as a product, that's great. Then you become a software uh, organization. But more of how I would think about that is having software, your custom written software capability be core to how you run your business. Like a lot of the admired uh, so-called tech companies are nowadays, but increasingly uh, other companies that are harnessing uh, software. So first of all, uh, I always like to make sure people understand who Pivotal is and what we do. I can kind of babble on and on without ever talking about specific products, which uh, drives our salespeople crazy, I imagine, who'd like to just get on to selling things. But there's two main areas that we focus on at Pivotal. Uh, underneath, as an enabler of becoming better at software, becoming a product organization, we have something called Pivotal Cloud Foundry. Now, you'll hear me refer to it as a platform or something that does a lot of cloud automation, but it's essentially a platform, a runtime environment that manages uh, packaging, configuring, running, doing health checks, monitoring, managing, the thing that runs your software. And it runs on top of private or public cloud, whatever type of infrastructure you have. And it automates, as we'll see, a tremendous amount uh, of the things needed to uh, uh, run that infrastructure, removing a lot of toil and wasted time from the system. Now, on top of that, we have a set of tools, uh, anything from developer-oriented tools to the Spring Framework, uh, a very popular way of, of doing Java development that lots of Java developers use. We have ways of doing .NET development as well. And we also have uh, sort of workflow products, if you will, like Pivotal Tracker that helps you manage the features you do week to week. And uh, Concourse, which is a build pipeline orchestration um, product that we have. Now, on top of that, putting technology in place is definitely uh, necessary, if you will, but it's not sufficient to transformation. And what we find are there are two key things you need to transform over, what our customers find. One is how you develop your software. And we move from a service uh, waterfall way of doing software to a product way of doing it. You create these product teams that follow a highly disciplined practice of agile software development and lean design driven ways of doing things, uh, as we'll get into, to deliver on a product, not just delivering on requirements. But also, especially at large organizations, the culture, the process of the organization has to change as well, which becomes the key job of executives and enterprise architects who then need to program the organization to be more of an innovation-driven uh, organization rather than your traditional service delivery organization. So these two areas are the broadly the buckets of secrets, if you will, that customers of ours uh, go through and how we help organizations transform. So speaking of the types of organizations we work with are globally uh, diverse, uh, industry diverse across the board, all the way from someone like Sonic selling you hamburgers and their, their lime slushies, if you get the chance, very delicious, their cheese covered tater tots, something uh, fantastic sort of for a dish. If you like the, uh, the hairdresser uh, kebab that, that we have up in the Netherlands where I live, it's kind of similar except with tater tots. Anyhow, to uh, banks like HSBC, uh, to manufacturers like Daimler and Ford, Boeing, 
uh, other types of manufacturers to uh, cable providers, insurance companies, anything that you can kind of imagine if it's a large organization. They all share this common desire and need to get better at software, to be more competitive, but also to grow their business, as we'll see at the end, by entering new markets and, and reducing their time to market to uh, really get to the point where their software is helping drive their ability to grow and create better businesses. So let's look at an example, and then we'll get into what the secrets are, uh, if you will. Uh, and for those watching along at home, sorry that I keep saying secrets and digital transformation. That's kind of the slot that I've been assigned, but I don't know. People like that stuff. No, I'll go back into my character here. So this is an example, I think, that uh, brings into, into play all of the different things, uh, and it goes from an analog to a digital transformation. So this is a, a picture, an example from the uh, United States Air Force, the U.S. Air Force. And every day, they have lots of jets and planes and things like that in the air, doing whatever it is you would imagine the military does. Uh, and they have to plan out refueling uh, all those planes uh, midair, right, in order to fulfill their missions. So they plan out on a daily basis the air, the refueling tankers that need to go up there. And it's a very, it was, I should say, a very manual driven process. There was a bunch of people shouting things back and forth, some Excel spreadsheets and email and even representing it in a PowerPoint, if I remember. And they have this whiteboard where they plan things out and draw a lot of lines. So there's a lot of things going on, if you can imagine planning out tankers and refueling. So it's a very fragile process. If they get it wrong, they would have to recalculate maybe not the entire system, maybe sometimes the entire system, but significant parts of it. So it's very error prone, not, not very uh, you know, good, if you will. Uh, but also it takes all day to do and required like eight or 10 different people to go through it. So it's a typical analog process and probably very similar to the process that many organizations have that they would want to improve. So what they ended up with when they focused on becoming more of a product organization and created a much better way of doing this, moved to a product-centric approach to solving this problem. You can see an example of that application here. I think it's on a Microsoft Surface, so it's got a, a nice, uh, you know, fun touchscreen way of doing things. But they ended up with this product that was much more efficient, for one thing. So it cost much less, and it gave them all sorts of cost savings, as I'll get into. But it also, because they could actually deploy it and add new features on a weekly basis, that product is becoming better on a week by week basis. So as an example of that, uh, and this is a good example of what being product centric is, when they first put some of the initial, when the product team put some initial versions in place, it didn't look like, and we'll, I'll go back, it didn't look like what you see here. It actually looked like more of a traditional application with drop downs and wizards and different screens, you know, to plan things out. But because they were observing how people are using it on a weekly basis and because they could improve it on a weekly basis, they found out that the airmen and women really wanted something that looked more like the original whiteboard, right? They just wanted all of the back, back end support of computing things and inputting the data and cleaning it and being able to rearrange it. And then all of the fun like touchscreen stuff of moving things around. But they were very familiar with the form factor of a, um, of a whiteboard. So eventually that's the UI they ended up with, which got them all of these great uh, productivity improvements. Now, also, by putting in place a product-driven approach for doing things, they were able to move from five years to actually feel that as used an application, the first version came out in 120 days, which is an astonishingly fast rate. And now, again, they're on a weekly basis. And because of the accuracy and the efficiency of this application, not only do they need less people to, to run it and operate it, but they are able to save about $200,000 a day in fuel uh, because they could send up less tankers. So they were much more accurate. So that gave them a, a very quick return of investment on that. So you think about this as a very prototypical type of application you would use. And it gets you to this point where because you're doing in things in a product-oriented way, your software is better and more efficient, and you can better meet the business needs and even the, the business case of, of what you need to do. And, and you end up with much better software, essentially, by focusing on doing software the best way and improving it rather than just delivering on a project or a set of requirements. So what's at the core of doing this? At the core of it is this idea of what I think of as a small batch process. And some people think of it as lean startup and other things, but you can see it here illustrated by one of our customers, Air France KLM. And that is, and again, think of the Air Force example. When you're thinking about a way to solve a problem, you come up with a theory of how you would solve that, it kind of driven by design, if you will. And the way you test that theory out is you write code, and most importantly, you actually put it in production, you put it in front of end users, and you figure out, you observe if it's solving their problem, right? So is that uh, non-whiteboard way of, of doing tanker rescheduling working, or there's still some sort of like mental clacking going on in people's uh, brains as they found out? 
So that theory was misproved and you learn something new. That's not the best way to solve that problem. So eventually you go through the cycle over and over again, right? You're always learning or failing as we'll get into and, and learning by failing. And you come up with, oh, we should just make a digital version of the whiteboard and let's test that theory out and, and figure out ways to improve that and make it better. So you put this process in place, this fa fast feedback loop in place. And on a weekly basis, you're, you're gathering a tremendous amount of learnings, but you're also actually improving the software on a weekly basis in small increments. Now think about how this is different than if you specified like, you know, 300 pages of requirements and exactly how it should look. And then five years or a year later, you delivered that and you would have another cycle to observe and learn. And it would take you quite a long time to actually improve that software. And I would suggest that that long of a feedback cycle means that you really are never going to improve in much of a timely way. So you really need this small loop and a, f a feedback loop that allows you to observe and improve the software as you're going along. So getting to that point, uh, one of the secrets, if you will, is that you rearrange the, what your organization looks like to be centered around product delivery, right? To be centered around the way a software organization would arrange themselves, not a project delivery uh, kind of traditional IT organization. So there's still the business at the top, if you will. And I mean, the, the, the layering here is not necessarily judgmental of import. It's just the way people think. But, you know, you have the business side, whether it's government, you know, nonprofit, so to speak, or for profit. And they have their strategies and the things they want to do. They want to refuel tankers, for example. And then you have your IT leadership that's crafting and driving how the IT organization works. Enterprise architects who are determining technological choices and kind of gardening the overall thing. There's another talk that I give going over what they do. At the center, you have these product teams that I've been alluding to. These are the ones who think about how to solve the problems, they design it, they prioritize how they'll solve it, they product manage it, and they write the, the code, they, they're developers who do it. And supporting that, using something wonderful like Pivotal, Pivotal Cloud Foundry, is the platform engineer team or site reliability engineers, SRE, if you're familiar with the Google term for it. And they run this highly automated platform that removes a lot of the toil and enables the product team to focus on uh, product and adds in all the stability that you get, you would expect from a, uh, a good cloud platform. So let's start off by looking at the product team and then we'll look at the other two uh, as an example of what transformation looks and try to expose the, the secrets of transformation. I, I love that framing. So the product teams, uh, first of all, the primary thing to realize about them, and you can kind of see this in play in this, this uh, example from one of our other customers, Volkswagen, is they're a unified, or as we would say, balanced team that owns that product end to end. So if you think of that tanker refueling application, they own thinking about it, discovering what the features are, writing those features, supporting it in production, all, all of it. They own it like a product, just like if you were a software organization, the product team would own it. Right. So it's not it's not the responsibility is not shared across the office of the PMO and the DBAs and all these people. It's all everything that this team needs. Uh, they have to do it. So they're autonomous. Uh, they're trusted to do things and they have developers, they have designers and product managers. And they're following a very rigorous uh, way of doing agile development and design, uh, all dependent on that platform that removes a lot of toil from them. Now, as one of the secrets, as you can tell, all of the wood they have is very pale colored. Uh, so they always, you always have pale wood, kind of a birchy color, I guess. If you have dark wood, remove that immediately. Just take it all up, put it on a piece, an ice flow, light it on fire and send it off because the dark wood is not going to enable you. You need light wood and lots of airy spaces. Probably. Now, how Pivotal Labs helps people out, and you can see the processes and the actual skills and, uh, and practices that get introduced. So Pivotal Labs works with you. They pair with you uh, to start introducing these new features. So they'll follow this practice of pairing with developers, the designers, and the product managers, and they, they teach you by doing uh, what these practices are. So in development, you always do test-driven development. You follow a lot of the other extreme pro programming practices, a, a variant of Agile that we've been doing for the last 25 years. And your developers learn to pair program with each other, and you get that, that uh, boost in productivity we saw they tend to end up coding 90% of their time instead of spending time goofing off and doing administrative tasks and worrying about remediating tests because the quality of, of their code goes up from, you know, instead of spending about 20% of their time developing, now they're up to like 90% of the time, which is a, a metric from Allstate uh, when they started changing the way they, they did the development. Now you also work with labs designers and you learn how to be very user-centric, how to run through that small batch process and come up 
and study, come up with new ways and studying how to improve the way the software is. And then you learn this overall lean approach to product management, where you're on a weekly basis, you're trying to get the minimal amount needed to kind of move you forward, learn more, and actually learn from what those experiments are. And again, go through that small batch process. And all of this is an incredibly disciplined way of doing things. It's not kind of like this cowboy coding way that a lot of agile design is thought of. And what you find is that once you learn this skill, you, you know, the Pivotal Labs people eventually rotate out and you continue pairing and they, the Pivotal Labs people can go work with new teams. Or you have your trained people in these teams, they go seed and work with these new teams and you can scale and spread that culture up on your own. But what you find is you have a much more predictable, stable, data-driven way of doing development rather than what seemed like a stable way of doing it with a 300-page document. And now you actually uh, find that you release consistently the same amount of features each week. Uh, teams tend to deliver on what they say. And what the features that you do and how your software is implemented is totally driven by actual studies and what actual users are doing and what works and doesn't work than on this kind of 12 to five months, uh, five year speculation that you had when you wrote those giant documents. So next, let's look at platform engineering and see how they contribute uh, and enable the product teams to operate, but also get to the point where they're enabling your business to have more agility and get to the point where they can start programming their business as quickly as you can uh, deploy and program the applications that support it. So the way that platform engineering operations people uh, transform themselves is they start to think of that infrastructure, the capabilities, the release management, all those things that IT service management and ITEL has tried to deliver on. And they think of that as a product that they're delivering. So in the same way that your product teams are customer centric and product centric and delivering a product on their own, your operations people are delivering a product and their customers are the product teams. So they do this by putting in place a platform like Pivotal Cloud Foundry. So instead of having to build all their own stuff and continually work on it and monitor it, just as your product teams use frameworks and other reusable components instead of writing all that stuff on your own, you get a platform that does that for you. Now this platform not only provides a way of orchestrating and managing containers and running on private or public cloud, but it helps automate and remove a lot of toil from the system so that you are much more efficient in the way you do operations. Now, as an example of that, you can see over at Daimler, and this is for one of their, um, their sales uh, customer facing things where you go and kind of figure out which car you want to buy. They did this value stream uh, mapping in, in operations and they found out highlighted in orange that they were spending a huge amount of time just provisioning hardware and, and getting doing capacity management from it. So this led to the strategy that they had of using Pivotal Cloud Foundry to dramatically, practically reduce the amount of time it would take just to get infrastructure, which is of no value if you're buying a car. You don't walk in and say like, thanks for taking all that time to provision servers for me, right? That's not why you buy a, a Mercedes. Uh, and so they were able to remove that toil and automate that as much as possible. Um, and so consistently what this, this uh, platform engineering team is doing is removing that toil and automation and also thinking because they free up all that time, they can think about how they improve the platform and improve the life of their, their customers, the product teams, and also even consult with them initially about how to set things up. Now, what you end up seeing is because so much is, is automated, right? Think about like, uh, you know, your Googles and other people of the world who they have to automate at the scale. And we, you can easily take all of those learnings and automate a tremendous amount of your own infrastructure. You see these insane efficiencies. Uh, all of your operations people become a lot more productive and efficient in the work that they do. So it, 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 at T-Mobile USA, for example, they support 300 developers with just eight operations people, three, eight platform engineers. Now, if you think about uh, a platform, a product team has anywhere from four to 12 people on it, right? So if you kind of do the math, that's a lot of applications that they're supporting with just eight operations people. And you see similar numbers across the customers that we have, for example, here from uh, Dick Sporting Goods. Uh, and this is just six months in. Uh, you can imagine they'll scale up to more and more developers uh, without uh, you know, having to raise the amount of operations people they have uh, very much. So the platform that we have, just to give you a very brief overview of what Pivotal uh, Cloud Foundry is, because, you know, as the professor down there always says, please try my product uh, to give you an overview. So at the bottom, like I've been saying, it runs on top of any infrastructure that you want. We have there's a great uh, kind of ready to go reference, uh, fully certified application that runs on top of VxRail. 
that's fully integrated top to bottom. So you can just get up and running uh, quickly. If you don't want that, there's another way of using VMware uh, to do it as well. That's, that's integrated. You can run it on top of OpenStack uh, or on AWS, Google Cloud. Lots of our, our retail customers like to do that and other people who don't want to compete with Amazon. You can run it on Azure's public cloud or the Azure stack and private cloud, whatever infrastructure you want. And Pivotal Cloud Foundry has this layer that does a lot of the automation, the provisioning, the configuration management, uh, making sure you can scale up and scale down and you have remediation, auto remediation in there. You have that layer and it, does, it hooks up with uh, setting up network and storage. So you don't really have to worry about any of that kind of stuff. It also will manage operate the operating system for you. So you no longer manage operating systems. I mean, think about that. That's just representative of a lot of the efficiencies that you have. Think about all the time and money you spend managing an operating system patching it and upgrading it, not having to do that anymore uh, when you're using Pivotal Cloud Foundry. So then there's two main ways uh, that developers uh, now, product teams, deploy their applications. They can use a Pivotal application service, which is an incredibly self-service. You don't even need to worry about how things are packaged up or run. It just does all this for you and uh, will easily add in uh, all your spring boot and your spring ways of doing things or .NET support. So it automates all of that and has all the services and middleware that you want. If you want more control, for example, to run uh, services and more data intensive things, uh, you can use the Pivotal Container Service, which we work closely with Google on. And it does, uh, it allow, it's a Kubernetes distro that allows you to have all the control uh, of doing container orchestration that uh, Kubernetes does. And coming very soon, we'll have a serverless uh, way of doing things with Pivotal Function Service. And then on the other side, you have, as we call it, the marketplace, because it was made up in the 90s. And in the marketplace, you have all of the integrated uh, middleware and other services, whether it's cloud services or API gateways or systems management and monitoring things, or databases, or queues, whatever it may be, are integrated in there so that you have the same self-service way of doing it, right? The developed product teams don't have to worry about setting up and describe, figuring out how to manage that, and it's all integrated together. So that all gives you a very self-service, platform-as-a-service way of doing that allows the product teams to focus on. So please, try my product. So finally, let's look at uh, leadership's role in this and why they're so important. So as this quote from uh, um, one of our, our, our champions, if you will, at T-Mobile says, when you're looking to scale up to a large organization, leadership is, is vital, right? Like it's one thing to do one to transform one team over, two teams or three teams. But transforming, for example, at J.P. Morgan Chase, they have like 19,000 developers, if not more. Leadership executives and enterprise architects are going to need to get together and really spend a lot of time getting their hands dirty uh, or maybe cleaning up their hands, I guess, to, to manage that organization. And they really get to the point where they're programming that organization and applying a similar small batch process to improving continually on a week to week basis, what the culture of that organization is, the process and the norms they follow. So it's, it's certainly necessary for executives to be just as involved and change as much as we've asked development and operations to change. So what this, this change management is, how you change to a culture of innovation, clearly you need some crisp vision and strategy as always. And I think a great example is what you see in Singapore from DBS Bank. And their vision is to bank less, live more, right? And if you think about your experience using the software with a bank, right, the idea is like you don't want to, you don't go and like have this ongoing relationship with your banking software. You just want to be in and out to pay your bills, check your balances, figure out whatever you need to do and go back to living your life, right? So they want to create for their customers, their users, the best software experience possible. And they're putting in place this product-driven way to do that so that they're continually improving and allowing their customers to live more and bank less. Now, what you're really doing is you're creating a culture of innovation rather than a culture of service delivery or process delivery or project delivery of, of even like SLAs and things like that. You're putting in place uh, people who are trying new things. They're curious about solving problems. They're risk takers, right? And a thing like risk taking is a weird phrase. It means largely we think of risk taking as we celebrate the successes, right? It's very rare that we're like, they're a real risk taker. They sure are great at failing. But in fact, that's what you're doing if you're innovating. You're constantly learning. You're trying out new things and you're failing at it. If you remember back to the tanker uh, example and a few other examples, you're trying new things out and you fail, but you learn from that failure and try something new. So how would you create a culture that's, that celebrated and was actually interested in failure as a core competency that they had? 
Now, a lot of how you do this is you establish a lot of trust with the organization that you actually mean what you say and you reward this innovation that you have. And, you know, you're going to have to figure out how to do that uh, per your organization with the constraints that you have. But as one sort of like quick little uh, summary, you want to establish these product teams. You give them as much autonomy as possible, right? So you don't want to micromanage them. You're asking them to take on risk and be innovative. So you remove dependencies, for example, by having Pivotal Cloud Foundry in place so they don't have to depend on database people or networking. They have all the tools in a self-service automated way that they need to succeed. You trust them to actually go about uh, solving problems and being responsible instead of micromanaging them. And you give them the voice to have, because they own the project, uh, the, the product, they need to determine what's best. And you, you trust and you give them the voice and the autonomy to actually own that and be true owners of it, which I think is a dramatic way of thinking about how you usually think about the various functional project-driven service delivery people that you have. So there's a lot more to be said, uh, and I'll give you some references uh, at the end about what this, uh, this leadership looks like. But the point is that you in leadership are going to need to change as much as you're asking everyone else uh, to change. And then, of course, if you're one of these staff people and you don't see leadership changing, you should talk to me afterwards because we've got a lot of great jobs at uh, Pivotal, and they give a really nice referral bonus if you stay 90 days. If you want to leave on day 91, I don't care, not my problem, stay 90 days. But I can talk to you about that afterwards. So let's look at one final example that kind of brings all of this together and illustrates uh, why, why it's so important. So this is Liberty Mutual. Uh, and this is a uh, insurance company, large insurance company. They do car insurance, home insurance, all types of insurance. Uh, so they wanted to enter a new market for them, the Australian motorcycle insurance business. Uh, and they wanted to do it uh, as quickly as possible, right? They wanted to have a, a fast time to market. And of course, they want to sell as much as possible. So there's this business strategy that they have. Now, their IT's ability to be a product-centric organization wasn't uh, sufficient to do that, it wasn't the only thing required. I'm sure there was, there was business development and marketing and pricing and actuaries, all sorts of regulatory stuff going on. But IT was a core enabler of it because they had this product-driven approach, because they could learn and, uh, on a weekly basis. So within six months, a tremendously small time to market, uh, they started up this business and they started selling insurance uh, to Australians who drove motorcycles. So they, because they had this product-driven approach, they made the agent selling, uh, in selling software more and more efficient. They removed the time that it would wait, right? They wouldn't say, like, the computer's slow. And they were able to better come up with plans and better qualify people. And this, uh, also because they were delivering on a weekly basis and they conti could continually improve it, you could see that they had a tremendous business effect, right? So the average strike rate, the average close rate or sales rate was 20% of, of the people that you had uh, inbound. And they were able to double that to 40%, which is astounding, right? That you would double the average rate. And if you think about putting all the, the effort it takes to transform over and how hard it seems to be to scale over, right? Once you have that kind of success, all of a sudden it's very easy. All these barriers get removed. The business is pulling you to do it. You get lots of funding, right? So if you orchestrate and manage this transformation uh, as well as Liberty Mutual did, which is certainly possible based on the experience I've had with lots of other organizations, things will be hard at first, but they'll start to become easier and easier as you get the benefits of improving the way that you do software and you've really uh, transformed your organization. So finally, to summarize, uh, there's, there's a good ways to get started. Uh, so we have three core ways of getting started, other than just getting Pivotal Cloud Foundry and starting on your own. So standing up Pivotal Cloud Foundry is something uh, that we have a team called Pivotal Cloud Foundry Solutions, PCFS. If you can save that five times fast, then you're better than I am. But they will go through a 10-week course with you to not only train you how to do it, but they actually stand up Pivotal Cloud Foundry. They actually create your platform engineering team. They put practices in place and you actually end up with the platform, right? So you don't just end up knowing how to do it, but you have that team in place. We have similar 10-week processes with Pivotal Labs to work on standing product up, but also modernizing existing applications. And over a 10-week, uh, again, working POC, if you will, you actually end up with applications that are ready for production. Uh, and it might be anywhere from two to 10 applications, depending on how simple they are. But you're learning and actually doing in that, that course of time. So 
it's really easy to get started. And then you can slowly expand and, and build on more and more projects as we see at the U.S. Air Force, Liberty Mutual, Air France, KLM, HSBC, and all those other companies uh, that have transformed how they're doing things. So uh, with that, if you're interested in more detail, I've got a, a booklet uh, that you can get for free. It's a couple of years old now, and I'm reworking and rewriting most of that booklet into something I should be done with at the end of the year. And you can find both of those. You can find the complete draft and process and excerpts and other more detailed presentations I've done on this topic uh, at that URL down there. And also, I'm happy to uh, take questions if we have any time or talk afterwards. Otherwise, I'm uh, very easy to get a hold of. Um, and I live just down in Amsterdam, so I'm always happy to uh, travel around Europe to talk to people in person. And uh, with that, uh, good luck and uh, thanks for having me.